Hi, I'm Laura Desmond, CEO of Starcom MediaVest Group, globally based here in Chicago. I remember when I got my first cell phone. It was 1993. It was a big bag phone, kind of the size of a small briefcase, and I used it in my car. <laughs> uh, flash forward now 20 years, and our mobile devices have come a long, long way. I have five of them, and believe it or not, they can all fit in that small bag phone briefcase, and I have a lot of room left over, too. That's how big it was. So who's behind the invention of the cell phone? Well, it was 1973, to be precise, when a general manager at Motorola made the first phone call to his friend and rival at Bell Labs. His name was Martin Cooper and he has launched us all into a completely new and different world of mobility and connected, connectedness and devices. So without further ado, I want to welcome back Tom and his guest, Martin Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Martin, can you hear me now? I can hear you very well. <laughs> OK. So uh, maybe this is urban myth, but I, I like to believe that um, it, it's true that you were inspired by the Star Trek uh, communicator and it came out in 1963. Yet the first cell phone only came out in 1973. What took you so long? Uh, you know, uh, Tom, uh, sometimes you do things in your life that you're sorry for the rest of your life. Uh, they made a movie called How William Shatner Changed the World and came over to my house, and I got caught up in this thing, and they almost convinced me that William Shatner invented the cell phone. But in fact, even before 1963, we had this vision that people are mobile. They're fundamentally mobile. They really want to move around all the time. You look at the traffic uh, out on, on State Street, and you realize that. And uh, so uh, we didn't need William Shatner to tell us that. We, we knew that ahead of time. And the first flip phone didn't come out until uh, uh, 1980, so. Really, much, much longer. So I, I kind of crowdsourced a question which uh, you know, shows some of the hazards of crowdsourcing, but uh, here, here it is. So what do you think the cell phone would have looked like if our ears and our mouth weren't located so conveniently close? Well, I, everybody here has seen a picture of that first cell phone. Does everybody know what it looks like? Well, I just happen to have it here. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. There it is. There we go. The thing that changed everything. Now, this cell phone weighs uh, two and a half pounds. It has a battery life of 20 minutes. <laughs> but of course, that's not a problem because you couldn't hold it up for more than 20 minutes. But this is not. Let's take a look at this. Oh, yeah, it's. Uh, that's not what we really designed. It's not exactly a pocketable thing. Well, but, the team uh, that put this together and it really was a collaboration. The top designers at Motorola got together and they had a contest to see who could come up with something that would be a personal phone. Uh, and they, in two weeks, they came out with four different models, all phones that you would buy today, the slider, a flip phone, it was just wonderful. We selected this one because it was simple, but the original model was this big. It really was a small cell phone. And then we gave it to the engineers, and they had to squeeze into this little box something in excess of 2,000 parts. This is before we had things like large-scale integrated circuits. Uh, and uh, so the phone just grew and grew and grew, and that's what it ended up like. Yeah, those damn engineers, yeah. So did you, did you have any idea that, you know, from a design perspective, design in a broader sense, that that a cell phone would, you know, at some point become almost a personal fashion statement? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm really not very enthusiastic about that. I have a view of uh, what good technology is. Think about it. Technology is here to serve us, to make our lives better. So good technology ought to be transparent. Hopefully you don't even know that it's there, but at least it should be intuitive. And what we have done now is let cell phones control our lives, and that's simply wrong. So we're using fashion to disguise the fact that cell phones uh, are really not very good technology, except for one feature, and that is what we start out with. The only really important revolutionary feature of a cell phone today is the ability to talk to somebody else 
and to text. Not according to my 13-year-old who texts me from the other room, but yeah. um, did, you know, many people think of this thing as sort of like a, an army field radio. Was, was that part of the inspiration at some level? And were you upset with the engineers that it ended up of course. this big? Our, our religion, Tom, was you cannot be too small, you could not be too light. So it was a heartbreak for us to come up with a phone you know, of this size, but uh, we had no alternative. That's as small yeah. as we could make it. So many people say that the thing that holds us back from the future more than anything is the present. And I think this is a remarkable example of um, not only designing the thing, but more importantly, as Thomas Edison sort of designed the electric grid in addition to the light bulb, this is an example of you thinking through the infrastructure, the, what is now called the cellular network. Um, so was that, a, was that a barrier? Did you feel that that was a, a positive constraint? Well, the, uh, I, I think everybody here knows how cellular works, right? The, uh, the, or doesn't work, right? Or doesn't, as the case may be. Now, the history of wireless communications is that there was a transmitter in the middle of a city and if you wanted to hold a conversation on a radio channel, you transmitted from this transmitter, you, you talked back from a radio somewhere, usually in a vehicle, and you could hold one conversation on every radio channel in an entire city and perhaps 100 miles beyond. The concept of cellular is to break the city up into a lot of little individual radio stations. And being engineers, we had to come up with a unique name, we call them cells, but each one is really a separate radio station, and now we can use a frequency in one radio station and reuse that frequency just a few cells away and again and again. Now, on a single frequency, we can hold in Chicago perhaps 100 phone calls. Now it's practical to have lots of people. So you do need a lot of infrastructure. That concept of cells was invented at Bell Laboratories, which was a part of AT&T, uh, and that was uh, done actually starting in about 1946, if you could believe that, and uh, evolved through the years. Uh, and finally, in 1966, uh, uh, Bell Laboratories, which is a part of AT&T, largest company in the world by every measure, and they announced that they were ready to go public with cellular technology. And their version of cellular had two interesting aspects. Number one, it was gonna be a monopoly. They were gonna be the sole provider. And number two, uh, their version of cells was car telephones. Now just imagine, for over 100 years, we had been trapped in our homes, tied to our desk by that copper wire, and now we are gonna be trapped in our cars. Well, <laughs> we at Motorola didn't believe in that. We wanted competition. We thought the world was ready for real personal communications. And that was really the stimulus, the genesis of this phone. You uh, famously uh, hold the patent for a radio telephone system. How do you, you know, with an audience likely filled with lots of entrepreneurs, how do you feel about intellectual property, needing it, avoiding it, using it in some interesting way? Well, the, the purpose of the patent law is to give somebody an exclusive for some period of time so that uh, they can get the benefits of the whatever, whether it was genius or stimulus or uh, 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 the things that excited them to do that. Uh, today, that process is being abused a great deal. Uh, I don't want to get personal about Apple, but they're not a sponsor, right? So we can do that. Not yet. Uh, and Apple, uh, uh, as an example, uh, patented the shape of the, an icon on a, on a handset. Now that's an abuse of the system. So somewhere or other, we have to tweak the patent system so we can still encourage inventors to invent new things, but keep people from benefiting from the system that really don't deserve it. Interesting. So um, I guess most people in this office, or in this audience, would want me to ask you the obvious question, which is, what kind of cell phone do you use? Well, well I, I have a new cell phone every couple of months. Every time they come with a new one, uh, I have to have it because people like you keep asking me. So I, uh, this is not a commercial, uh, but this phone was just announced two weeks ago, and I was at the announcement. It's the uh, Motorola Droid M, and about the only really unique feature is 
It's, uh, they have managed to make the screen uh, so big that it almost touches the outside. So we had a small phone uh, with a big screen. But uh, it's, it's Android, and uh, Android keeps growing and growing. Sure. And what, what growing. do you think phones are going to look like in five years, <laughs> 10 years, 15 years? And, and beyond just what they're going to look like, what do you think they're going to do? Well, back to what's good technology. You shouldn't even know what's there. The, the cell phone, I think, is going to evolve into the functionality. That's really what's important, isn't it? And so the talking part, well, the phone ought to really be, maybe start out uh, being uh, in your ear. Uh, ultimately, the uh, talking part of the cell phone is going to be embedded in the skin behind your ear or someplace. Uh, and you won't even know it's there. And you want to make a phone call. And you say, uh, computer, uh, get Tom on the phone. And the computer will say, which Tom do you want, the one in Chicago or the one in New York? Well, Chicago. And the next thing you know, I'm talking to, to Tom. That's that part. But the, the other things that are important in connecting you to the rest of the world, and there are so many things that are going to be done. The first revolution was the ability to talk and to text. The second revolution and the third and the fourth have yet to happen, but they are just starting to happen now. We are about to see a revolution in healthcare based upon wireless, based upon the fact that today you get a physical examination. I get one, an annual physical every five years, whether I need it or not. And uh, the, the uh, examination is essentially worthless. Why? Because you make a measurement on somebody, and it's a single measurement. You have nothing to compare it with. But suppose that you could have a physical examination every five minutes or every minute. That capability is just coming upon us. You will wear a sensor on your body. That sensor will measure 30 or 40 different functions in your body, transmit those things through a device that you'll carry with you, but you don't even know it's there. I, qu I call it a, a, a personal server. Uh, and a computer will monitor you and anything that looks abnormal. You're about to have a heart attack. We can predict that within uh, 12 or 24 hours and prevent it from ever happening. So wireless gives us the opportunity to revolutionize healthcare by changing it from curing disease to preventing disease. Every disease is actionably preventable. If you know it's going to happen at a time, that's going to be a revolution. We are going to revolutionize education. If you think about it, our educational system is kind of backwards today. Uh, I took a, uh, a car, uh, which uh, the Chicago Idea Week was nice enough to send, me, uh, send for me at the airport. And the driver says to me, you know, these phones are wonderful. I can find anything out. That's true. We don't need teachers to give facts to students anymore. They have access to every bit of information in the world. They, we ought to be teaching children, students, wherever they are all the time, because they'll be wirelessly connected. And then they can go to school, and the teachers can provide them with the wisdom to use the tools, teach them how to think, not pieces of information. We're going to have a, a revolution in education. The biggest revolution that's going to happen is in collaboration. We are now in the Pong stage of collaboration. Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, all these things are really social things and have not yet become extremely useful. But think of putting all of these things together and running the world, running companies, in a way that people collaborate and every person in a, a network does what that person is most capable of doing and does it 24-7, wherever they are, not in the mode of corporations today where people sit in meeting rooms and in one hour try to make a significant decision. That revolution alone is going to multiply our productivity enough so I believe it's going to solve really big problems like the problem of poverty. One quick personal question, last question. Um, was there anything in your childhood that made you somehow feel that you were going to change the world? 
What kind of kid were you? Well, I was a nerd. I, uh, I have uh, memories uh, going way back where uh, I was always taking things apart and occasionally even putting them back together the way, the way they were. I tried to make a, to burn a piece of paper when I saw some kids doing this on the street uh, using a magnifying glass. Have you ever done that? Because it focused the sun onto a piece of paper. So I broke a Coke bottle and tried to reproduce it. So I've always had this curiosity about how things work. Uh, and then I got caught up into uh, mythology and I read every book on fantasy and mythology that I could find. And of course, when you read books like that, you really do believe you can change the world. Well, so, you uh, certainly did. Martin, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's an honor. My great friend.